Hi, so this is a further deeper dive into velocity. We covered a quick overview of it in the previous session. Recap for those who haven't watched it, and Keith, correct me if I'm wrong. So velocity is all about caching. A uh, typical canonical scenario is that you perhaps front-end it between, say, a web server and a database, and by putting things in memory, it's generally faster. Is that a, a fair 10-second yeah. summary? Absolutely. Memory is obviously a lot faster than taking things off disk. So the common, let me check it, so I've got this right. So the most common scenario is probably going to be web applications. Is that right or not? Or probably simply because the numbers can be so enormous and some of the demands on fetching stuff from a database for multiple users can be so large. But there's no real has to be the way it could be anything. Okay, so we could write a rich wind forms Absolutely. or a, you know, WP. And again, as we were talking before we started, there's no reason why there has to be a database there, ah. but it's a common scenario. So we could actually just use this as a really fast bit bucket, just out there in memory. You're not going to hit me just because I said <laughs> But in theory, we could just do a memory work, but fronting a database seems to be the most common scenario. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, um, some questions here. If I'm writing some code, and it's going to be sort of accessing the back end system, this is on my middle tier web requests coming in. First of all, I can talk to both SQL and one of these as part of my data and persistence strategy, can't I? I'm making conscious co yes, choice in the sure. code. And what we talked about before is the fact that there are different types of data. So there's some data that definitely needs to be persisted. Um, that needs to be in a database, SQL or any other database. You need to keep that. What Velocity is all about is keeping more of that transitory data, high, potentially high read data that you don't need to go back to the database for. And if you think about it in computing terms, there's an awful lot of data that never really changes. It doesn't change for, for hours or days on end, uh, but it's read sub-second, and so it's a, it's a good candidate for velocity. So when I'm running my code, I've got to be thinking about this in the design of the code is, what am I access, what's the read yeah, and write absolutely. There are different types of data, some is suitable, some is not. And of course, just to make it very clear, it doesn't need to be just read only. It can be writable code. We talked about session before, and of course, a session um, data is a, is a great scenario for velocity as well. So, <clears throat> come back to your question, of course, um, how do you get the data into it to, to velocity in the Because this will start off empty, I guess. Start off empty, you, build, you bring up the system, you bring up all the um, velocity servers. We've got two here, there could be ten of them, let's say. I'll come back and ask you why you might have more in a second. Okay, so how do we populate it? Well, you know, you just basically write a piece of code today that says, you know, uh, basically a bit conditional that says fetch it from velocity, if it's not in velocity, fetch it from a database, put it in velocity and return it to the user. That way, um, whenever we access anything that's not in the cache, it will be populated into the cache the first time and then read subsequently from the cache. That also means in many scenarios, if one of the velocity servers goes down, it's holding the data, and uh, again, in the previous video, we talked about fault tolerance. But assuming you don't have fault tolerance in the system, and it's the appropriate type of data that's stored in the database, so something like a, like a catalog, then you can pull it back, pre and populate it into velocity again using that type of scenario. So if this one fails, and it's that scenario where the real yeah. data is yeah. here, the one true source, we just get a bit of a performance yeah. hiccup. Very, very simple. Whereas coming back to the session scenario, then of course, you need that data. You're not storing it in the database and it's been updated periodically. So that's where the availability is more important. That's where you may make this velocity red tier machines highly available so that there's a way of recovering the data. Okay, so you talked about the machine. So we're, I'm gonna pick you back up on this question okay. here. Why would we have multiple velocity machines, especially as we said before, you know, SQL does quite a good job of caching and here we're going off and yeah. buying other machines. So SQL does an excellent job, but this tends to be quite an expensive box. These can be relatively expensive cheap boxes. Box. You know, no matter whether it's SQL, whether it was Oracle, whatever, it'd be a big box. Um, these can be potentially small boxes. Now a couple of years ago, we'd probably been talking about putting four gig in there maximum. Whoa. These days, of course, 64 gig is relatively cheap, and so you could build, let's say you had 10, uh, 15 machines, you could easily create a terabyte cache, and that might be excessive, but it's within the realms of process. There are some people who would want to <coughs> so cache, you can yeah. build a very large mid-tier cache. 
And of course, the, the neat thing about velocity is it will hash the data across these machines. So not only do you get the ability to, to put cheap machines in there that are relatively scalable, you get the fact you get almost 100% um, scalability. So you put one machine in, you get n IOs per second, so maybe 20,000 IOs per second. Put two in, you get double that, etc., etc. Um, so there's a hashing algorithm built in. Yeah, it's just works out. Data. So um, if you have more machines, then it just scatters it the stuff. Just puts the data across. We will get to the, the complexities yes. of the algorithm that's in the documentation, but basically it will spread the data across. So you can imagine you might have one cache um, running down it logically across these machines, which is not highly available, and another cache because you have a different type of data that you run across the machines, which is highly available. Now, am I right in thinking that regions, which we touch on very recently, don't go around across right. things? So regions are another concept within velocity that allows you to actually enumerate the data within the region. So it is a useful concept. But a region will sit on one server. However, what people do get confused about is that a region can still be highly available, so there can be another shadow of that region. So it may be that you have, I'm running at pen colours here, but you have a region here, it could still be duplicated over here if that's what you want. But when you interact with it, you're it, interacting yeah. with that one. So you need to think in terms of scalability, because there isn't the same scalability characteristics, but there's better enumeration, so there's a trade-off here. There's also another thing you can use within regions called tags, so you can actually mark certain data items. So let's say we go back to your, the product, product catalogue example, you could mark certain products as say fast selling products, and then we can enumerate over that tag and just pick those ones out. So though we're not using SQL, we can still selectively, using things like regions and tags, identify the data that we want to pull out. Because we don't get SQL type queries, do we? We actually programmatically get it. V1 doesn't have that sort of concept. So that would be the biggest difference from someone who's yeah. used to select star from whatever. Absolutely. And the API is the one we talked about on the So we talked about the API um, in the, the previous video, and it's actually worth how, you know, just covering that a little bit. So there's a bunch of DLLs that you'd add to your, your, your client, whether that's a user client or a mid-tier client. So a client, client of velocity, client velocity, not client machine. And this, these DLLs would provide you with basically um, the, the capability to talk to this. And this um, is all managed code? Yeah, and the, there, are, there are certain things that you can play around with here. So for example, you could just have a simple client that just talks to um, a machine and that machine will then route to the relevant machine to pick up the relevant piece of data because the piece of data that I want to get is actually in a different system. Or it can be a smart client that will actually go to the correct machine because it understands the way the data is hashed. That's up to me how I configure it. So that's a trade-off in your program. We actually did that when we set things up, although we glossed over the code and some, to, but we actually answered those questions. And also, we have the ability to actually cache data here as well. Now, obviously, not as much data, hopefully, it's, well, typically. Because it negates some of the benefits of lots but of But this gives us even faster access, so we can have some of the hot data cached here as well, and then invalidate that at various times, etc. So we can have two levels of caching, caching within here, but also the main cache here. So there's quite a lot we can play So in theory, it could be in SQL's cache, Velocity's cache, or the mid-tier yeah. cache, depending on what's the most appropriate. And of course you need to think about what that means, particularly in terms of types of data. So I've, I've glossed over, and I'm, I'm not really going into different classifications of data. In fact, the online documentation talks about it quite well, okay. in terms of resource data, reference data, etc. But they have different types of, of behaviours and benefit from different ways of using this cache. And once you get that, it actually makes a lot of sense as to which one you would use for what.